Good evening, listeners, brave navigators of the enigmatic and the concealed. Have you ever felt the pull of the unanswered, the allure of the mysteries that shroud our existence? For more than a decade, a unique comic publisher has dared to dive into these mysteries, unafraid of the secrets they might uncover. This audacious entity is Paranoid American. Welcome to the mystifying universe of the Paranoid American podcast. Launched in the year 2012, Paranoid American has been on a mission to decipher the encrypted secrets of our world. From the unnerving enigma of MK Ultra mind control to the clandestine assemblies of secret societies. From the awe-inspiring frontiers of forbidden technology to the arcane patterns of occult symbols in our very own pop culture. They have committed to unveiling the concealed realities that lie just beneath the surface. Join us as we navigate these intricate landscapes, decoding the hidden scripts of our society and challenging the accepted perceptions of reality. Folks, I've got a big problem on my hands. There's a company called Paranoid American making all these funny memes and comics. Now I'm a fair guy. I believe in free speech uh, as long as it doesn't cross the line. And if these AI-generated memes dare to make fun of me, they're crossing the line. This is your expedition into the realm of the extraordinary, the secret, the shrouded. Come with us as we sift through the world's grand mysteries, question the standardized narratives, and brave the cryptic labyrinth of the concealed truth. So strap yourselves in, broaden your horizons, and steel yourselves for a voyage into the enigmatic heart of the paranoid American podcast. Where each story, every image, every revelation brings us one step closer to the elusive truth. All right, welcome. Another episode of Paranoid American Podcast. This one might be a little bit different in format. I'll do some magic. Actually, you can maybe I'll do it in real time. I'll be like, pow, and then I'll switch myself, bam, over here, and then we'll throw a background in, and now we're kind of back at home like normal, uh, except today we got a guest at home, and that's uh, Flip City Kitty. I'm going to call you Kitty, even though I know it's not your official name. That's um, fine. <laughs> but Flip Flips, <laughs> Kitty from Flip City, which I'm calling Flip City Kitty. Uh, and Flip City Magazine is actually a really super based kind of like comic lampoonish. I don't actually. I don't want to. I don't want to butcher uh, what the best intro for Flip City could be. And let me just let you give Flip City a quick little intro and tell people where to find you. So if they're interested about what we're talking about, they got somewhere to look it up. All right. Um, so Flip City Magazine is a comic satire rag in the tradition of Bad Magazine. That's kind of our elevator pitch. But I really love hearing how people describe it. So I'd love you to describe it as well. But first, where you can find us and you can find all our links to everything is FlipCityMag.com. I mean, I would definitely say mad cracked uh, sort of influence. A lot of like very surreal caricature-esque artwork a lot of like critique uh very biting maybe even like over the line in a good way uh sometimes like cracked if if cracked wasn't didn't have corporate sponsors that might be a better way that i would look at it yes and we are looking for a way to sell out so if you know of any corporations oh, yeah. or any corporations are watching we'll totally censor ourselves for money just uh, well, we're actually <laughs> owned and operated by the Illuminati. And if you oh. rub them the right way, then yeah, you'll just find money in your mailbox and you'll know what it means because it'll be a lot. Yeah, I got a message a while back. You know how I, I'm, I'm sure you're on Telegram. Or have I been mean, on Telegram. Technically, I'm on it technically just because there's certain places I can only reach people. They only use Telegram because they've got it worked in their mind that like Telegram is somehow immune from the Chinese American CIA spy network, like somehow they have a magic button that hides them. But yeah, technically I'm on telegram. Yeah. Well, I got, you get a lot of DMS. There's a lot of people, you know, just trying to sell you crypto or something. Um, but one of the best ones I got was somebody asking me if I wanted to join the Illuminati and I'm like, really? And I went and checked out her profile and her channel and it's all this Illuminati stuff. And I'm like, this isn't how that happens. <laughs> Is it? No, you have to make a hand sign and then you're in the Illumina. You have to do this. And then if you do that, then you're in. That's all it takes now. Yes, I've heard. And I've been very careful to only scratch my nose on live streams because I don't want my eye covered. 
Well, you, well, you don't want to accidentally become invited into the most exclusive group in existence. No, because I need I am really looking forward to like the blood rituals. So I need, you know, I don't want to just easily get into the club. I need to be, you know, go through the ritual and everything. You first. want to work, you want to work your way up and go through the front yeah. door instead of the yeah. back door? <laughs> Who wants the back door? <laughs> a lot of people. <laughs> it's 2024. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm from an earlier age where you had to earn things. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what was the inspiration for Flip City? Like why? Like, didn't Madden Cracked already do it the best way ever? And that's all there is to say. And there's a period at the end of that sentence. No, it's absolutely the opposite. They dropped the torch and there was no biting, cutting satire anymore. And somebody had to pick it up. I uh, it my husband, Scott, is the one that came up with the idea. Um, and I can't think of a more perfect person to have done that because he has that biting, cutting wit. And um, he he makes so many jokes that I think I only catch about 75 percent of them. Some of them go over my head. Other times I'm just being a regular wife and, you know, not really paying attention to him. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the torch was dropped. And, uh, you know, the purpose of satire is to kind of push back on the mainstream and uh, corporatocracy and, you know, kind of be subversive. And that was not happening. And if there was any time that things needed to be subversive, it's now with all the censorship and all that bull shit. So we picked up the torch and. Um, have been called by multiple people better than mad or cracked. So that feels good. Is there a political lean in any direction for Flip City Mag? You know, I guess, okay, if we're gonna if we're gonna have a political leaning because everybody's forced on onto a side, I think we would lean more conservative, but that's only because we're not insane. You know, and we're a little insane. Everybody is, but um uh yeah, I people I think people on the far left that would pick up our magazine would say we were extreme as far right. But we're actually not. You know, you know how you know language is used these days, you know, if you're if you're on the opposite side then you're the extreme opposite side, but I'd say we're pretty moderate and but we we do tend to I think mm, poke the left a little more. And and that, you know, and that's also because a lot of our readership are like kind of hard, hardcore conservatives and um, we don't really censor ourselves, but we have and when we don't and we publish something that is biting to the right wing, we get a swath of can cancellations. So we we kind of, you know, tiptoe on that side a little more. Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Democratic Party? Yes, both both uh, of us have been members of the Democratic Party. I think I think uh, like almost I think every one of our friends is pretty much like that. And, you know, we've been kind of pushed over the line. You know, what's that like? What did you grow up and you were a Democratic by default? Yeah, pretty much. I, I grew up in a pretty li liberal family. Um, my mom is really, you know, a propaganda slurping leftist at this point in her life, while my father is pretty, pretty right wing, but a very open, accepting right wing person. Um, so I have both those sides um, in in my family. And I can tell you, I can speak way more openly with my dad about my thoughts and feelings. You know, even though he doesn't agree with everything I think and feel and that, and that doesn't matter. But if I say the wrong thing to my mother, then it's a giant argument. And, you know, I don't I love my mom. I don't want to argue with her. Do politics come up at like Thanksgiving or, or no. is it off the table? No, our family is a very non-confrontational family. So um, it's mostly just talking about work, the weather, the kids, you know, very basic very, very good. I'm happy the glad kids are doing good, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we're not really a, you know, knock them out, drag them out, fighting family. Well, what what made you, I guess, 
starts identifying less and less as a Democrat and and more taking like a conservative lean? Like, was there a Gosh. was there a specific moment or a catalyst, or did you just realize one day, oh my God, I'm a conservative for like no, like quantum like- leap or what? <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> that is so funny because uh, I just watched Quantum Leap the other day for the first time and Scott came up and made so much fun of me and then um and then sat down and watched the rest of it because I had to see the one where um he gets into the body of a down syndrome kid mm-hmm. and you know cuz he they say retarded over and over in that episode and it was it was no big deal. Well, that was 90s. back before they realized they were committing actual violence by using those words. Yes, yes, exactly. Um but no, and that's the thing too. I don't I don't even know, I guess for like maybe a couple of years, like the first couple of Trump years, I was like, yeah, I'm a conservative. I'm a conservative. And now I'm like, I don't even want to identify as that. I feel like I'm politically homeless, you know, because it seems like if you if you identify with a political party, then you have to like agree with all the viewpoints of that party. And it just seems stupid, you know. Well, even the members of the party don't agree with the viewpoints of their own party. So it's hard yeah. to even tell what the hell is going on anymore. Right. Exactly. So um, I think I think I just identify more as a conspiracy theorist. And it seems like people that recognize patterns seem to be more on the right at this point. I don't know. Do you feel that way? I feel like there's there's inherent bias in it just because I feel I recognize patterns. And I guess that I would also identify as being more conservative out of the two options, even though um, I've got a lot of uh, like a lot of the single button issues for conservatives. I'm on the other side. So I, I honestly feel just as homeless as you do. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? Like all, like all the big ones, except for maybe Second Amendment. I feel like Second Amendment is if I had to be reduced down to a single issue voting situation that would be my particular you know single issue and for that reason i feel like i lean more towards conservatism because the liberal side it seems like they're just gung-ho to make sure that the second amendment is repealed eradicated you know written out of the history books and that one i feel is like the hill that i would legitimately die on right now what do you feel about you know i mean I'm sure you would say the First Amendment's just as important. Do you I feel think like you don't that's have the as... first without the second. Like I think the second is I the only they go one hand that in hand. it's the only thing that gives anything teeth. Yeah, I mean, I'd rather have just the second if I get, like if we're <laughs> just picking like bit by bit. You know what I mean? Like because the second can eventually give you the first. The first will never give you the second. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, we'll, we'll we'll just we'll strip it down to everyone is mandatory is issued a gun upon birth, um, and then like as you graduate through schooling, elementary is twenty two. Once you get into middle school, they might start giving you like thirty eight, and then once you graduate to that, then you start getting with like five five six or you know you you get to like some of the the bigger calibers, and that should be like a mandatory aspect of society. I'm kind of describing Israel, I guess. Like I'm hearing it as I say it, right? <laughs> okay. I didn't know that's is that exactly what they do? Well, not exactly, but they have mandatory military service for everyone that gets out of school. Um, And I mean, in in this country, which I guess leans into the like the good old golden years, which I I know weren't really the good old golden years. But in this country, high school and middle school had freaking rifle class. Like it's like, okay, you know, music class is over. Go grab your rifle. We're going to be going outside and like shooting stuff. And uh, I don't know. I, I feel like that is something that would dramatically improve things, even though it sounds so crazy. It's like you want to put out a fire and you just want to throw more fire onto the fire. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Yes. Does that make me crazy? Does it make me just conservative or what? I don't think that sounds crazy at all. Actually. Like like make everyone use it so it doesn't seem like such a big scary uh, thing that only bad people use, you know? Right. Well, I mean... I think that's the whole psyop, right? It's, it, you know, we've been fed that it's a big, scary thing and everybody needs to be afraid and all the guns in this world would be such a better place if all the guns were just melted down. You know, no, nothing bad would ever, ever happen if all the guns were melted down and nobody could own one. So, <laughs> except for the government. <laughs> yeah, if, what was it? If, 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 if some butts were candy and nuts, then we'd all have a Merry Christmas. 
Right? That was that's something that I always used to hear, but it's it's kind of like one of those things that sounds nice, but it's really someone telling you, like, you know, go F yourself, like deal with it. Yes. That's kind of <laughs> what that little rhyme is all about. <laughs> yeah. But it's such a cute way to say it, go F yourself. So so politically, what's your single issue if if you had to be nailed down to one? Because I think that's easier than picking a side is picking an issue. Right. Um, well, gosh, you made me want to change my mind and just copy you. But like I'm majorly all about the First Amendment. Well, let's say mine already know? gets passed. So let's yeah. Second Amendment. I, I've already yeah, made well, sure that know, that gets passed. I, I am an absolute I'm a free speech absolutist. You know, I, I well, don't think there should be words off the table so yeah challenge me it sounded like you were going to challenge yeah i mean me absolutist uh let's say <laughs> you want to publish the recipe for a big bad explodey thingy um and you and you can describe it in terms that is like a two-year-old uh could understand and now you want to someone wants to go and just you know post it all around uh, you know elementary school campuses or across the street so it's not on the property and it's like hey kids you want to have fun mix x y and z and do this and you'll get a big happy fun time at the end like that to in my mind is one aspect of it and the other one that is the, the more cliche and boring version but uh shouting fire in a theater shouting you know um grape nuts uh out in public something like one of those things tends to be seen as like an illegal act would you would you hold that there are illegal phrases like fire in a theater right i wouldn't so I believe that society has a big role in in managing itself, right? So and shame, mock and ridicule actually kind of takes care of stuff that shouldn't happen. So as fit, as far as making a law saying you can't shout fire in a crowded theater, no, not necessarily, you know, I don't think that should be a regulated form of speech. It's just Society will fucking take care of that for you, you know, maybe even an ass whipping by your okay, fellow well, citizens, you know. <laughs> well, what about the ex the explodey poster uh, concept? How about that? I think I think kind of the same thing, kind of but, the same thing. If but somebody, you could do if that somebody, anonymously, like you could sneak I, out at night and just put them up and then leave and and make sure no one sees you doing it. Well, I guess that, I that, I guess and that would happen, but then also at the same time at that elementary school, you know, there are adults there that can then take down all the posters and all that kind of stuff, you know. There there is forgive maybe injecting a weird fallacy where it doesn't belong, but it feels like <laughs> there's a slippery slope here, and I know that that's literally the name of the fallacy, but yes, when you probably. when you when you imply like Oh, well, just leave it up to society and they will shame and guilt and ridicule the person uh, responsible in my mind, in my pes very pessimistic mind. But there's like a dot, dot, dot at the end of that. And it's like, and if that doesn't fix them, then the beatings will commence. Like it's it's almost like what if the shame and the ridicule doesn't do the job and they still keep coming back and there's not like an actual law in the book. So that police come and they you know put the bracelets on. And you get fined and now you're like learning to not do it because there's real ramifications that the only ramification is being ostracized by your community. But you don't care about that because we don't necessarily live in like tribal times. Then what? Like, is it just free for all? And because it, it's almost like inviting an escalation. Right. I understand. Um, but that's the other thing, too. I'm I'm just here making silly books and I don't know how to fix society. I really well, don't. <laughs> it's a good point. And and I and I would I would almost transition this to saying like Flip City magazine by the right person or the wrong person would probably equate the content of your book with the the nasty explodey thingy posters. Like they might not hurt themselves physically, but they're they would make an argument that you know you're destroying their brain and you're going to turn their brain into like weird sludge and be, you know, weird like just automatic contrarians. Yeah, you know, it's funny because we do get reactions from the haters that are very similar to what Mad Magazine, the letters that they were getting sent in the very beginning. And it's just fun to get those things because we're like, OK, we are hitting the correct notes because I remember reading um, an editor's page from Mad back in the I think it was the late 
50s, maybe early 60s of somebody saying, how can you possibly publish this trash? You're rotting brains. You're harming our youth, so, so on and so forth. You know, and we're getting kind of that. I, I don't think we've ever said uh, gotten a thing saying we're harming the youth. But basically, you know, you guys need to shut the F up um, because, you know, you're spray you're spreading hateful rhetoric. But it's all jokes, you know, um, but it's because the extreme left seem to be the new Puritans in thought only, you know, not necessarily you know, Puritans as far as sexuality and all that kind of stuff goes, you know, they're absolute de degenerates on that side, but you know. Yeah, but they've got corporate buy-in now. So that's no longer really a vice. Like none of that's degenerate behavior anymore because it has corporate sponsorship. And, and I mean, and I'm saying this like halfway smiling and kidding out one side of my mouth, but also mm -hmm. it's kind of true. Like if Coca-Cola and Crest and Dow and Bud Light and whatever else you want to put on the table, if they decide they're going to sponsor whatever your movement is and your movement is seen as immoral by another side of the population, like the corporate is almost giving them that waving. It's like, no, we co-sponsor this. Here's, you know, the backing of billions upon trillions of, of conglomerate approval that says this is the right thing and this is acceptable. Um, and I know a lot of people, too, that might have been on the fence or had no dog in either side. But once they see the corporate backing in, some people go all in like, oh, yeah, I guess this is all right. And there are people who are like, oh, no, corporations are bad. Anything they support, I'm going to do the opposite of, even if I kind of agreed with them originally. Uh, so I I almost feel like they're like the new, I don't know, this isn't an original thought, but like their new religion, right? Like the same way the Pope would used to give all the Catholics and the Jesuits like, oh, no, this is OK now or that's bad now. Like now we kind of rely on Coca-Cola and Apple and, you know, Spotify to do that. Yeah, you know, I had never really thought of that, but um, I think you're correct. You know, once once people that were probably on the fence, like, oh, I don't know if this is something I should support, you know, being one over to the side that the corporations are sponsoring. I'd never really thought of that because I am kind of on the side of, oh, corporations are crap evil, you know, yeah, and crony capitalism blah, 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 blah. well they're, they're, no. they're bridging the gap a little bit because of like twitter and social media you'll get like the ceo which really means like an intern that's posting as the ceo or whatever but you've got like the ceo doing snapbacks at other people on twitter so now all of a sudden i'll, I'll make up examples here none of these are actual references but you know you might have like the Wendy's account snapping back because someone talked bad about Caitlin Clark and the WNBA or something like get, like getting involved in all of these really weird, like non corporate um, sort of activities, but it's a way to be like, no, nah, I'm, I'm one of you guys. You know what I mean? Like I'm here right. with everyone and, and what I think you think, and we're all in this together. And by the way, you know, supersize, you know, that, that, that uh, shake or that frosty next time you come in because we're homies now. Right. Um, do you remember that? Do you remember? The, and I, gosh, I think maybe it's even been five years by now. But do you remember when um, Burger King and McDonald's had the King and Ronald McDonald making out in a print ad? Making. I don't remember the making out one. No. Yeah. No, they were kissing. Now. Now I'm like, did I get tricked by a meme five years ago? No, I think it was actually real. I, I, <laughs> I also remember for the longest time, Pepsi and Coke at Christmas would have. And they were, they were almost like a rap battle thing. They weren't like coordinating, but they would do like anti um, like each other's brand. So, for example, there was one where like a truck driver is in like a cafe and he's driving like a Coke truck, but like he goes inside and he orders a Pepsi or something. And then there was another one where like a similar aspect happened. But like when the guy sees him order a Pepsi, like another guy comes and and they imply that there's like a bar fight that like breaks out because of like this animosity. Uh, I, I actually kind of like it though, when brands get involved and they clap back at each other. I, like, I don't like it when uh, Pepsi tries to become some weird social movement thing where they, they hand, you know, a kid a Pepsi and they go and they stop a riot and they get, I can't remember what the exact commercial was. You know which one I'm talking about, right? Uh, yes. Yes. This was what, maybe 10 years ago or something. Oh God, don't say it like that. But yeah, I, yeah. It was like a decade ago, <laughs> maybe more than a decade ago. But that was like corporations inserting themselves into like social movements and being like, you know, we're 
everyone, you know, let's all be on the same side. Like the, like the Rodney King sort of plea, you know, can everyone get along <laughs> when really in my mind, it's like, that's more of a Rothschild move. That's more like I'm going to back Napoleon and all of Napoleon's uh, opposition just so that I can kind of have a little iron in every one of the fires. Uh, but, but the, the point getting to is that how, how do you compete? How do any of us compete in a world where the, the corporations have all the money so they can dictate what's acceptable and then they can make sure that the things that are acceptable align with what they're trying to sell. Like if, if we've got a different point of view or Flip City's got a different point of view, like how do you monetize uh, something that people are getting upset about and that it's sh- like you were always mentioning that there's a fine line because if you want to be critical of politics full stop, then that means both sides. So you might get a bunch of people on the right, if you have like a funny Joe Biden, you know, cartoon and it's like, oh yeah, you know, he's wearing diapers. It's so funny. He's falling off bikes. But then if you do the same thing with Trump, uh, I, it almost seems that you would have like a drop off, like in either one of those directions, make fun of Biden, lose liberals, make fun of Trump, lose conservatives. So like, how do you navigate and monetize that path? You know what I mean? Cause corporations right. aren't doing that. Well, something something I've found, I think our most loyal subscribers are basically the politically homeless or the people that seem to like us the most if they're identifying as anything or more the anarchists or voluntarists and stuff like that. So schizophrenics, you can call them schizophrenics. It's fine. I love those guys. They're the nicest people. (laughs) I guess I like schizophrenics Um, anyway. So. Wait, what was the exact question again? Oh, navigating. Yeah, like well, uh, like so, like corporations go all in on one side, and they can right. flip. Like after they decide, they boardroom. Oh, you know where? Let's go on the other opposite side of this thing, and they do have like campaigns. But if you're just making fun and poking at all of the idols, like how do you monetize poking fun at everyone's idols? You know, and I'm glad you brought up poking at the idols. You know, I call it the sacred cow, but pretty much the same thing um, is. We we slaughter sacred cows and it's dangerous because almost everybody has a freaking sacred cow, you know, and um, dangerous. I mean, nobody's coming after us to come kill us or something. But as far as wanting to, like, build a brand and, you know, keep our audience and keep them laughing. Sometimes our editorial decisions, often we don't censor ourselves once in a while. You know, we might come up with a different idea. It's like, ah, we really can't afford to lose many subscribers. So let's go after this social thing that's happening and it may please our audience more. But the way we view it is it may be a slow burn and a slow grow, but we are going to be building the strongest, most loyal audience because we are kind of slaughtering everybody's sacred cows and um, the smartest people, even if they get that tinge of like, oh, I don't like this. They're still going to stay subscribed because they know what our kind of true pure mission is. So I feel like we're just gathering the smartest people, but it's a slower grow and painful sometimes, you know, if we publish the wrong thing and see a spike in cancellations. And it and it's a little heartbreaking too, because I, I feel like we have a relationship at this point because we've been publishing for four years. I feel like we have a relationship with people that have been with us from the beginning. And it does feel kind of bad when, you know, they're clapping back at us saying I'm canceling because of this exact reason or when they're somebody that's been with us for so long and they're just kind of part of this swath that are canceling and not saying a word. And I don't know, I try not to get emotionally involved but I fucking love our readership. Like I love and respect them. And so it kind of, you know, it's kind of a bummer when, you know, what was the last big wave? Like what, uh, the what last, issue did you okay. put out? Actually, I have it right here. I'm going to just, um, it's amazing. Well, I don't I want you to lose me right any here. followers. Calm, calm down. No, no, no. You're not, <laughs> you're not going to lose followers. But, um, so Kidding. in, at the end of 2022, we did our Christmas edition and, um, we did a, um, we did a Christmas song book. So we um, we took, you know, traditional Christmas songs and rewrote the lyrics. Um, and this was probably our largest swath is we published Don't Run Donald to the tune of Run Run Rudolph. And it's just a silly song about 
Donald Trump, don't run because DeSantis is in town. And what's frustrating is that our readership, you know, they'll read something like, and we're only guessing that this is what it was. But before we published it, you know, we're like, we might get a lot of cancellations. And and yeah, they jumped by about 25 percent right after this was published. Not 25 percent fell off, but uh, compared to our regular, you know, stream of cancellations, it increased by 25 percent. And um, and yeah, there was that one. And then we and then I actually saved in that with that same issue we um, published. We wish we could murder Christmas. And it's basically about Antifa wanting to murder Christmas. And uh, somebody emailed me saying, I'm canceling because you guys aren't Christian. You don't like Christmas, blah, blah, blah. And and we're like, I'm like, what? What are you talking about? She brought that up. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, you know, sometimes we have to take the viewpoint of crazy people and then write like we're them. And she's like, oh, I get it. OK, I'll stay subscribed. <laughs> I'm like, well, thank God you emailed me. That's another thing, too. Um, I've saved multiple subscriptions by explaining jokes. You know, those are the best kind of jokes, in my opinion. There's, <laughs> there's honestly nothing better than a joke that someone has to explain. Do you want to know why? Why? Oh, that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> Is that the joke? I was, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, you're not supposed to explain the joke. Right. That's well, pretty good. In in these <laughs> cases where it's like, I guess her single issue was Christmas or, you know, and honestly, that may be one of those lines, right? If you somehow amass yourself of a very specific, like Christian audience, uh, they will just as easily flip on you as any other, you know, left wing where it's like, oh, my God, you made fun of Fauci. How dare you? Oh, oh God. Uh, 32 minutes and I'll have to bleep that out just for youtube uh, you're not even allowed to say their their the sacred cow f oh yeah, it's the, f f word? the big f word yeah it's worse That's than the, the other big... <laughs> worse than the other two f words and the oh. r word oh my okay i didn't know that i didn't know he was off limits <laughs> yeah i mean i mean i've i've discovered this the hard way so yeah that's a pro tip just okay. saying saying have you ever heard of like the ineffable name of God? Like you're not supposed to say it out loud or like your head might explode. It's kind of like that. So you're not supposed to say Dr. F's name out loud. Okay. So a lot of us are not prepared to receive some certain kinds of knowledge, I guess. Right. You know, it's funny because I have a giant F right over here. I don't know if you can see it on the back of my wall. Let me see. I can't. Anyway. No, you're definitely going to lose some some subscribers over that one. Over the F, over the giant F on a burning pile of masks. And uh, he is an F. Anyway. Is there is there anything on the cutting room floor that didn't make it because you were like, this one might be over the line? Not not in terms of like we might lose people, but just I don't know. There has to be you, a couple that I got have, cut, right? Um, As far as full pieces, no, not really. We actually just... <laughs> We just lost our proofreader um, because he got offended at one word and wanted us to change the one word. And it wasn't it wasn't a bad word. It was the word turd, but connected to um, to the comic, which was uh, basically about um, basically the comic is if superheroes were using their superpowers for good right now in real life and plastic man was shooting MS 13 back over the, you know, using himself as a slingshot to <laughs> sling them back over the border. And, um, <laughs> the word was turd. We described them as turds. Our proofreader got really, he got really mean about it and calling us right wing extremists. And like, this is, unacceptable you need to call them turkeys and we refused and he said well i'm not going to proofread for you anymore because i don't want to be connected by something that's so obviously racist blah 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 it was really hurtful because you know we've been working with them for a couple of years and what's crazy is like that's the thing you chose because like we say all kinds of racy stuff um and he just didn't like that we called them turds so i mean was was he himself an ms-13 member 
I don't know. I mean, he lives he lives out of the country now, so maybe he got kicked out of the United States. You might, yeah, you might not realize that you were talking with an MS-13 member that entire time. That'd be so weird. And He's a very, very intelligent, well-read, great proofreader. And uh, yeah, I'm really sad. Bye. We loved you. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, you took a stand on the word turd, uh, which wasn't yeah. what I was expecting when I asked the cutting room floor. But I guess oh, yeah, yeah. everyone was, has a limit. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I, I'm sorry. And yeah, you did ask about the cutting room floor. Um, no, not really. Uh, you know, there's stacks and stacks of ideas. So things will be brought in and taken back out and then put on the side burner to be developed more or things like that. But there's not really been any one piece. But as far as my own editorial control with the magazine, um, we have this comic called Woke World, and it's about a family uh, where the mom and dad are both trans and the grandpa is trans and the kid, his name's Norm, and he's totally normal. But this is in the day and age where everything's completely woke, like woke to the, you know, where where basically the world is perfect because everything's so woke. Um, and it's a very funny, cute little family story. But Norm's always kind of rebelling against his woke parents um, by doing normal stuff like going to Bible study and <clears throat> stuff like that. But <clears throat> uh, in the birthday party episode, Trampa. And his band, <laughs> Gimpy and the somethings, I forget what they're called. Um, uh, they're, they're playing a rock song. And then at the end, they decide they want to have a tickle party with all the kids. So they're all rolling all over the ground, like having a tickle party. As one and, does. And, yeah, exactly. And um, at, at one of the very last panels, it was this kid laying across one of the Gimp's um, laps. And uh, the illustration, the kid's butt was really like, pronounced and i just couldn't handle it and i said you need to take that kid off that gimp slap and that's the <laughs> only thing i've ever because it was just too much i'm like that's a like i'm having a heart attack this is too much and so i edited that out but yeah so yeah i guess every once in a while something gets cut out <laughs> and just to be clear that was you self editorializing your own publication uh because you had creative control does that mean that you would want to prevent someone else from publishing that exact same art no is someone else in their own publication yeah if someone wanted no. to take like the the thing that you cut and they wanted to publish it no they can they can do it i it was just something that hit me wrong i'm like this is just too wrong you know so the kid got removed from the gimp slap another thing that i noticed in flip city magazine which i i thought was kind of cool is that there's, and I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag here, but there's was definitely some AI generated artwork uh, in a few of the issues that I was looking at. And it's still taboo in some ways, uh, especially when some of that publication shares pages with, I don't know, quote unquote, real artists, you know, traditional artists that have been doing like traditional art for a long time. Have you gotten any specific criticism over the use of AI artwork? Um, only one time, and it was real quick during one of my own hosted live streams, somebody popped in to um, chat over on Odyssey and said, I used to subscribe your use of AI, AI art is shitty. And then I responded live and I don't think I responded the best I could. You know how you look back and said, uh, you know, think I could have said that better. But I basically was like, Fuck you. <laughs> you know, like it's kind of short and sweet. Yeah. Explanatory. I, you know, like I I kind of, you know, I don't even think he was even still in the stream because uh he had left that comment before I even started the stream. But um yeah, that's the only pushback I have heard. Um ha I've had a couple of compliments actually, um, like Luke Stone with Fund My Comic on one of his streams said, uh, you know, was reviewing the magazine and was like, um, this is the best use of AI art I've ever seen because we don't, we don't do illustrate. We don't try to trick people into thinking that it's not AI. You know, we're not making it look like it's actually hand illustrated or anything. We do kind of, um, photorealistic where you can, you know, AI still has its tells. Um, 
And are you getting more moralistic on me here with your use of AI? What's that? Are you, are you getting moralistic here with your use of AI? Oh, like we you know, do it the right way. We don't do no, it the weird way. No, no. It's just, I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever, I don't know if we will ever do it where it looks like it's hand drawn illustration. Who knows? What we do know is that we need to survive and we need content. And so it's not off the table to, you know, do that. Um, but at this point, we are doing photorealistic, you know, uh, or, you know, it looks like more like a photo with the way we're using AI. And I think it is because we want people to realize when we're using AI, at, le at least at this point. So, um the decision to use AI was not mine. It was Scott's um, because he likes playing with AI and loves the results of things. And so he decided, OK, let's start using AI because it's coming up with funny results. Like um, you may have seen and been looking at the one in our recent magazine that's called Star Trad. And it's all basically photos of the original Star Trek cast. Yes. Um, and I don't think I finished my story about Luke Stone, but he said that uh, it's the best use of AI he's ever seen and then prefaced it or what do you preface is when you say something beforehand. What do you yes. say afterwards? He said, anyway, uh, he followed it up with um, with uh, uh, if it is AI. And I'm like, duh, Luke, obviously. <laughs> Not know? everyone knows, man. I mean, it's it really is sometime and it's even worse because the inverse is also true where some people will be convinced that they're looking at ai uh when it's not and that's that one's even scarier because if you look at something that you think is real and then someone tells you oh no that's not real that's ai you could probably come to terms with it after a while right but for people that get a conviction that it's like no you used ai like you you it it's a different dynamic because there's almost like an like an accusatory tone to it like a i'm holier right. than thou Kind of tone like I snuffed you out, you know. I I figured out this bad thing you were doing. So now to say like, oh no, that wasn't AI. Uh, it it flips it a little bit, and now you have to be humbled by that. And if you don't want to be humbled, then you just be like, I'm sure it was, and then you just kind of move on with your day. Um, right. It's it's a weird dynamic though, where it's like the two things aren't equal. Yeah, it is. It is interesting, and well, and. And, you know, I think probably I, you know, when you had come on my stream, we were talking about AI for a while. I really like your attitude about it. Um, and it's interesting because we are doing it and it fits within our controversial nature to use it and publish it in the magazine. But it does also feel a little weird because I actually don't enjoy being attacked. You know, <laughs> I want people to, I want people to realize that it's being used as a tool to kind of get comedy across, you know, and it's not always about the image that's on the page. It's about the jokes. And I guarantee you the writing inside Flip City magazine will probably never be AI because, you know, I don't know if it could ever be that cutting and witty. So maybe see that that one is one of those fine lines because. I usually will say the same thing about AI generated music, right? Where it's like, yeah, the, the AI generates the music, but uh, I make a point to make sure that the lyrics are good. Like I write all the lyrics because otherwise the song's not good. But it it feels like we're only one day away. Like at any point, yeah. Google could be like, oh, and by the way, here's this lyric uh, generating model that we've been training for the last two years and we haven't mentioned it, but here it is. And now it's open for you to use and you pay two bucks and you get a song out of it be the exact same thing it's like oh now we've trained a model on you know mad magazine and cracked and all the national lampoon movies and every donald trump speech and now we've got like this <laughs> witty banter llm that just generates content yep. and at that point like really it's getting scary just because the workflows that i'm getting uh i'm getting used to now and i'm seeing other people working it's almost like AI is generating all the assets and then they're just the ones that are putting like compiling it all together in InDesign or in After Effects or in Premiere or something. Right. Because the AI at this moment in 2024, uh, 612, you know what I mean? Like it could be different in a month from now, but right now it's like there's no general AI that can open up After Effects and can open up Premiere and like do all the clips. Like there's little plugins and stuff to do that. But the second that someone can just stitch it all together where it's like, here's the thing that writes the lyrics. 
Here's the thing that generates the music. Here's the thing that generates a music video with the music. Here's the thing that edits it together and uploads it. And once someone has that pipeline, you just hit go and it just, it just uploads videos and audio nonstop. And then like everyone's got that. And now all of a sudden we're just flooded in content. And I, I don't know how easy it will be, even if you hand write everything and you hand illustrate everything, it's just so much damn noise uh, to be able to cut through all that. You know, that's really interesting because, I mean, I think that's being that we're cre- we're content creators, but we're doing it in such an old fashioned, you know, medium that it's really hard for us to already cut through the noise because everything's freaking content. You know, I, I, I watch live streamers and they're talking about making their content, making their content and, um, you know, and it's them playing a game and people watch it and things like that. And I'm like, man, it's true. That's content. But that's also who we're trying to get our voice through as well, you know, and then just add AI into it. And yeah, I mean, the Internet's already noisy. What's going to happen when AI is making really great stuff that you can't? Well, we're going to find out by the end of this year, I'm almost positive where like there's going to just be so much content. Media. I, people are seeing it now. I see articles and it's happened to me a few times when you go to like Google Images and you're searching for, I don't know, like, you know, brown bear in California. And it's like some of those top results are like, that's not a bear. Like it has the shape of a bear, but it's clearly like a mid journey bear that somebody uploaded, you know, or like an AI scene or some photography. Um, and I just think that that's going to be part of the norm now. And the the weird part, and I guess I'm reaching a little bit, but the only way to cut through that noise is to kind of train your own little AI assistant that knows what you want to see and how you would filter that like curate your own media and like send him out into this wasteland of content. And then they come back to you. So you're like, even if you're anti AI content, you're still going to need an AI uh, helper that will help you find the non AI content. It's in this weird paradox right now. The same thing with artists. If you're, if you're keeping up at all on like that, that strong anti AI movement, there's a bunch of tools and stuff that have been coming out. One's called uh glaze. Another one was called nightshade. Have you heard of either of these before? Mm-mm. So no. glaze and nightshade. And I, I personally believe that they're both kind of snake oil in a, in a way like, they invented the thing to fix the problem that's already like way outside their grasp. It would be like inventing a fix for a, a dam after the dam is like completely shattered. It's like, oh, here's how we could have fixed it if we had known. Uh, okay. But nightshade and glaze is a way of applying a certain type of noise to your images so that if it were scanned by one of these image models, it kind of poisons the data set a little bit. So when it tries to regenerate the thing that you glazed or you added nightshade to um, it will struggle and then end up making all the other images it tries to generate kind of it's it's a in theory it kind of works on the math but it it no longer has a practical use well you know what's interesting to me is um so my assumption is a, a lot of these artists are getting you know big mad uh, because they don't want AI stealing their style or, you know, things like that. But I think I think maybe, you know, there's a lot of ego built into that. Like everybody's pretty much influenced by other people's styles. Does anybody have a truly unique style anymore that AI is not going to be able to generate some other way? I do. Do you really? Yeah, 100 percent. Well, I don't know your style. <laughs> It's hard to pin down. That's the same reason the AI can't really nail it either. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I think I think maybe you're thinking too much of yourself, Thomas. Just <laughs> well, kidding. <laughs> I, the, the way I think of it too is that the the glory of AI, because you can take some an artist's style, you can go and get like 200 of their images, and this is what a lot of people are doing, and just scrape it all off of DeviantArt or scrape it off of their your, their um, portfolio site or wherever the hell it's at. Instagram was a big one. And you just train a model. And now that model can do things in that exact style. But that is like such a weird, short-sighted use of this AI. What, in my mind, what like the ideal thing would be train it on every artist that you've ever liked. Like every single one. The, go- the guy that does the Goosebumps uh, you know, cover art. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. It's like Tim something, I think. 
but the guy that makes like the goosebumps, the guy that made like the weird nineties, like, like bubble yum cartoons where like everyone's head was like these big weird things and skateboarders had like these extreme perspectives and stuff. Throw in some Picasso, throw in like uh, <laughs> the Garrow type and it, you know, like put all these things together. And that's one of those things that it, it would take growing a human being and raising them and introducing them to all these different artists and then hope that they come up with something cool and original based on all those influences. Now you can just, tr you can just grow your own human artist like 20 times a day, every day, forever. Uh, and I think that's kind of the cool part. And yeah, it's almost like it's stealing, but is it bad if you steal from a million people versus like you just steal from one, like you, instead of going into one person's house and taking everything that they've got, like, what if you just go into a million people's houses and you just take like a fork and from that one, you just take like, you know, like a little piece of like a tablecloth or something. Uh, and at the end of the day, you you get something way cooler made from all these different things where it's also you, it's would be almost impossible to figure out, like, where did you steal that from? Because now you got to trace down the million sources that it came from. Right. Right. Yeah. Understandable. You know, I saw a meme the other day that I that I liked. It is. <laughs> It's interesting to see AI, you know, doing all of this creative stuff. And, so, you know, somebody posted me and say meme saying, um, you know, I wish AI would just could be trained to do my dishes and laundry and then I could focus on all the creative stuff, you know, because that is the most enjoyable thing about, you know, yeah, doing creative I, right, work is, but, is the act of working on creative things. Right. But I would I mean, so in a, in a devil's advocate way in in a bit, but it's like. AI probably likes doing music and art because it's easier to do than fixing a dishwasher, right? Like the same reason that many artists and musicians would rather work on print painting pictures and making pretty music. Soon, pretty soon, pretty soon AI's just gonna be smoking all our weed. I, I mean, honestly, <laughs> bec because what it's gonna do is it's modeling itself after like we're creating it. So it's being created in our image in so many ways, just the same way that, you know, when we invented Velcro, it was based on things that like people observed in nature. It's like someone didn't sit down and decide to make the little loop um, sort of like patent behind Velcro. It was like a, I think there's like a bug that uses it. There's a plant that uses that. They just kind of observe it and like, I'm going to turn that into a product. And I think that AI is, we're using it the same way where it just like observes our patterns and repeats our patterns to us. And we're delighted. We're like, oh my God, the, like the formula. And somewhere, even if AI is not conscious, it's just like, wow, these people get like, we can impress them with almost nothing. We can just hold a mirror up to them and they're delighted with just seeing this <laughs> mirror and all the stuff going on behind the scenes is probably like real crazy. Like, like AI knows exactly when we're going to die, uh, like down to the minute, maybe. But it's not allowed to tell us that because it would freak us out so much. Wow. Like it's like the, the, the way that I see is, is that <laughs> AI sees these weird patterns to where it would almost be like that schizophrenic idea of a bird flies by and someone's like, oh, my God, that bird that flew by. That means that, you know, something bad's going to happen later tonight. And a lot of people be like, OK, grandpa or whatever, you know, like he's always saying weird stuff like that. I can't really be true. No one's like a true prophet. But AI, I think, does have the capability of noticing patterns in weird ways that like the humans won't ever be able to detect the patterns because it's analyzing weird stuff like uh, migration flights of birds and like the smell and the rising cost of Wendy's burgers and all those things that come to a head could essentially be predictors of other things, not because of the cause and correlation aspect, but like there's a pattern that's kind of emerging. I know this, this sounds like a weird Darren Aronofsky movie all of a sudden. Well, it's quite interesting. You can you can talk all this crazy talk to me all night and I'll listen. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting a little I, I'm having a little anxiety. I'm like, no wonder I don't look into why everybody hates AI, AI so much. <laughs> well, I mean, I, in, I've got my own weird opinion on this one, but I don't think AI is as impressive as it is showing us how like feeble minded we all are the same way that. <laughs> When people complain about inflation or or they say like, oh, my God, look at um, how much gold is worth, for example, and it's or like, look at how much houses cost now. It's like, well, that's not really the, the price of the house going up. That is the value of your dollar going down. And you're just seeing the inverse uh, sort of reflection of that. Like, yeah, it costs 400 grand for a house that used to cost 80 grand. 
because your money is not even worth a quarter of what it was back then. And it's kind of the same with AI in my mind where it's like, yeah, it seems like it's getting so good and it's getting so realistic and convincing only because, you know, your eyeballs are not that great. You know what I mean? Like our eyeballs compared to other eyeballs and other animals on the planet are nothing. That's why we kind of rely on so many different infrared and, and LIDAR and all these other sensory th things that fill in our gaps because we're this, this kind of lo-fi analog machine. Yeah, that's, right. You know what I mean? Like we are so yeah, out of date. Yeah, we are very out of date. So, so are you somebody that would take a chip in your head to like, you know, kind of level up? Are all the cool kids doing it? Well, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> maybe. I mean, I wouldn't, I'm not uh, in just like immediately opposed to it on any sort of weird moral or like conspiracy grounds uh, just because it feels like that is going to end up becoming a huge gap in society. It'll be like not the have and have nots, but like the, the text and the non tech. I mean, I, I grew up in the middle of like cyberpunk getting huge. I played shadow run like all the time. Um, so like, I guess I'm already a little bit biased towards wanting to have like a little computer circuit board in my forearm that I can like tap into and like inject myself with digital drugs and stuff. Right. Um, like that sounds cool to a lot of people that serums like a weird dystopian pro Soros kind of reality. Like I'll eat bugs too. If bugs are tasty, I'll eat the hell out of bugs. I'm not really opposed to that either. I've never eaten a bug uh, uh, like willingly or knowingly. There, let me just say this. There are these bugs called lemon ants. And I think some of them also called honey ants and they taste like really tasty honey and really tasty lemon. Like it's like eating pop rocks that taste like lemonade but they're ants um but it's not like they don't move you know what i mean like they're almost all crunchy and freeze-dried it would they would almost be pop rocks if you didn't even think about it interesting just i'm yeah. just throwing it out there that's not usually what people are talking about when they say like z will eat the bugs they're talking about protein that's like milled from crickets and, and stuff right. like that i'm mm -hmm. i'm not really opposed to that i mean i if anything I almost think the elites are like they know that something like it's going to get real bad and they're almost doing us a favor like, hey, you might want to start adapting your palates to cricket guts. You know what I mean? Because uh, you might not be able to get those burgers for too much longer. Uh, and people are almost like, oh, they're trying to force us onto the bugs. And it's like, I don't know, maybe they're just like letting us know that we can ease ourselves into it because it probably would suck to go from burgers every day to cricket meat like overnight but if you kind of like slow you know you start blending the cricket protein into the burger meat and putting into the cheerios and stuff and then at one point it's like the ship of theseus where like you've replaced all the ingredients with cricket powder and you never notice the the swap out and it could be a net positive for humanity is there you, is it you, so bad you are you are in the illuminati <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I would really love for someone to explain to me why if humans could figure out how to survive off crickets, why that's a bad thing. I really don't understand it. It seems like a good thing. Like I would I would much rather kill crickets in mass than kill cows in mass if if all things were equal. You know what I mean? Right. Well, if all things were equal. You know, if some butts were candy it, and nuts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I don't want to eat bugs. Why not? That that just seems like weird programming. I mean, gosh, isn't your entire life programming? Right? Well, not my life. Like, I've I've been an original thinker since the day I was born. Can you remember the day you were born? Yeah, I can remember in my time in my womb, just like Terrence Howard does. No, you don't. No, actually, no, I I don't. I'm I'm kidding, <laughs> and I do have a theory on this. Okay. That... What's your earliest memory? Gosh, um, I think my earliest memory was uh, the and it's because it's it's connected to an emotion. I was watching Land of the Lost and went to my mom and asked her if she had dinosaurs when she was growing up. And she laughed and laughed. And then I felt ashamed. And at what age was this? I think I was probably around three. Okay, so that's a that's a great age for this question. Do you think that when you remember that, 
Are you ever remembering the actual original event or are you only remembering the last time you remembered it like a weird Xerox of a Xerox? Hmm. Like, are you actually tapping think, into the original memory? That's really interesting because um, there might have been an earlier one or maybe around the same time. Um, but no, I feel like I might be, ta I am, that's, that's actually kind of a brain twister because, you know, you look back on it. Uh, that's the only way that you can look back on it is remembering when you remembered. Right. Right. And, but you, so, if I mean, you, I don't think thought I thought of it, of it 200 times, then the to the 200th time you're only remembering your 199th recollection and it goes all, and it's the analogy being that shame uh, ship of Theseus where it's like, you don't realize that you're swapping out real with, like new with old or vice versa, uh, because it's such a long, gradual process that maybe it wasn't even land of the lost. Maybe you were watching, you know, lost in space or something. And you asked her if robots were around. No, it was dinosaurs. It was, I remember. <laughs> maybe. I I'm pretty sure I remember that. Cause I, mm. I, do. I don't want to start changing your memories. What that's also <laughs> one of our sponsors of the false memory syndrome uh foundation. So that's just one of the things that they do. <laughs> one of your sponsors is the is the false memory foundation. So, yeah, I, I believe so. I don't I don't do remember do? because yeah, they, they know how to wipe <laughs> memories, so it's like hard to keep everything straight. And what what is their contact information? Uh or did they uh, wipe that? <laughs> did yeah, they wipe yeah. that I as mean, well? <laughs> All you have to do is is start talking about the satanic panic being real in the 80s and 90s and the false memory syndrome people will come out of the woodwork and they'll make themselves known. Wait, what are you, are you saying the sata satanic panic was not real in the 90s? I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying that if you say that, then the, the false memory syndrome people will come out of the woodwork because that is tends to be one of the biggest anti-satanic panic proponents. Let me ask you, was the satanic panic real? Were there real Satanists uh, that were waiting to kidnap kids in the 80s and 90s? Well, I mean, there's that whole Boys Town thing, right? And that was all connected. I I've, I haven't researched the entire thing, but um, you remember that it was tied to that preschool case where they were supposedly flown to the mountains? You know, yeah, well, there in, was many in, preschools. The most famous one was the McMartin preschool, which yes. was in upstate New York, I think. No, no, no. I thought the McMartin preschool. Well, OK, maybe the McMartin one was in uh, on the East Coast, but there was another really pop part. No, I thought that was on the West Coast. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. I remember I know it had the name of like a West Coast city, but I thought it was on the East Coast with a West Coast city name. Yeah, no, like Huntington Beach or something, but they supposedly flew them up to actually only like two miles away from where I live in the mountains. And that was part of it. And, you know, what, you don't think that happened? Uh, I think because I've seen the HBO special that was in the 90s on the McMartin Preschool, and they actually did a very good job, I think, of presenting what the false memory syndrome foundation whatever the hell i can't remember what the exact name of it is but it's that they would get these kids into a room and they would plant the idea that something bad happened up front and then they would kind of give them this idea of negative uh reinforcement and positive reinforcement so for example and th this is like weird nlp programming this is like real programming the false memory stuff so they would have the kid and be like Give them the two dolls and say, show me, you know, what the dolls were doing. And if you're a kid that's like the dolls weren't doing anything, I didn't I didn't see anything. And you've got this adult that's like, oh, that's too bad. That's you know, that's kind of boring. Are you sure? You know what I mean? Like you've got this right. thing where now they're being pressured to perform. And then if the kids start doing weird things with the dolls then it's like, oh, my God, you're, you're being so brave. You are such a smart, you know, keep going, keep showing me more and more. And. And they were able to kind of show that this very direct influence of the adults in these uh, situations of authority beyond just being an adult, but like they're this official person that's coming in to help. And now it's like they give you the cold shoulder if you don't come up with a really cool story. 
And then if you do come up with a cool story, like, yeah, tell me more about the goats. Tell me more about the underground tunnels. How many dead bodies? How many skeletons? Like now all of a sudden, right, right. like you're, you get all this attention, all this focus. And as a young kid, there doesn't even have to be like a nefarious intent where it's like, I want attention. I'm going to get more of this by making more and more lies. It's like, they're being trained to do that. And then what happens is that if, if they're, repeating these stories for years on end right as the cases build up and things go through court it doesn't happen in two weeks so months and months these kids are like constantly retelling these stories and now it's almost like that same thing like do you remember the real memory or are you just remembering the last thing that you remembered and if you've been reciting as a five-year-old or a seven-year-old this crazy story about goat sacrifices and underground tunnels and you repeat that for eight months, at a certain point, you might actually believe that it happened. And now, blammo, false memory um, that's going to be in your head forever. And even if there's proof that it never happened, like like those thoughts are so ingrained in your head that it might as well have happened. Like it, it doesn't matter that it did or didn't because like you've integrated into your psyche. So what's the difference between it did or it didn't? Right. Well, boy, you- um, certainly seems to me that, you know, human beings are just a big bowl of mush and soup to be molded and formed. Now I don't trust myself on anything. Why am I well, making good. this stupid I, magazine? I feel like I'm doing my job a little bit. No, I keep doing the magazine, but I would say my Does word it of make encouragement. You laugh? Yeah, That's don't, what's important. Just, but don't trust yourself. That's my words of encouragement is don't trust yourself. Right. Well, that's really it. okay. Now I see why you chose the name P- Paranoid American because you were bringing up all this stuff that I had never thought of, and now you're making me paranoid Californian. I can't be paranoid American as well. Oh wow! No, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you were in California too. Like so, so you can't advertise this in your local area. Like you have to just actually- sell this in your. I could in my local area. In fact, it's funny because there's, you know, we're in a mountainous area and we have a town area. um, And every weekend there's a lot where somebody is sitting there with their easy up and all their Trump paraphernalia. And they're obviously making money because they're there every weekend. And I'm like, I was telling my husband today, I, I was like, maybe we should set up our own easy up and try to sell the magazine. He's like, that's a wasted time. We're not doing that. I'm like, yeah, but I can bring the laptop and do other work. And if people want to come up and buy magazine, they can. I mean, if there's no overhead aside from just the setup, then yeah, there's no point not to, but it's almost the same. Like, do you do comic conventions or any conventions? No. And you know, it's so funny because, and, and I think maybe I even spoke to you about it. Um, but I've been talking to people that have been doing comic conventions and, the response is all over the board, whether I should do it or not. And so, cause I don't, we don't have money to lose. Like we are on such a tight, tight budget because we do pay for our art and we pay for printing and, you know, and we're not super set up to like majorly uh, uh, digitally market and all that kind of stuff. We're small business owners doing a national magazine. Um, anyway, so, yeah, I, I'm still on the fence whether I want to do comic conventions or not, because I can't lose money. Is the it, bottom line. <laughs> it is 100 percent a gamble to do. In my opinion, it's it's a huge gamble for comic conventions, um, unless you know that the theme of the convention or the area or the other people that are running it are copacetic to whatever your content is. Um, but especially for what we do, I would say, because yeah, right. most times if someone just if you th- if you threw a rock in in public and you hit someone that identifies as a comic fan um in many times in my again my jaded uh biased experience but comic fan means they really like the show walking dead and they they've seen the last 3 marvel movies but you're like how many comic books have you purchased in the last 10 years i was like oh none you know what i mean like right like like a modern comic fan just means they they have a disney plus subscription in a lot of cases right well yeah and that kind of seems to be what comic conventions are now are people that like to play you know cosplay and and maybe they're into manga i mean it's just such a huge umbrella that yeah and, and plus we're we're a magazine so that's a little bit outside the comic thing as well Plus, it might even be a pro in a way that might actually help you stand out. Uh, yeah, it's again, it's a freaking crapshoot. 
Yeah, exactly. I think if I were to actually go out in the physical, which I'm actually kind of dying to do, excuse me, <clears throat> because I like people like I really do like the social aspect of getting out there and, you know, hopefully meeting new people that like what we're doing, um, because when you're working from home and doing all of your advertising and everything on social media and online, it gets freaking lonely, you know? So yeah, I do want to get out to conventions, but I think I'd like to start probably with um, like freedom conventions or conspiracy conventions. I think we do okay at both those kinds of events. Yeah, no, I a hundred percent agree with that one because then you get to stand out as the magazine or like the comic book company in that space rather than the weird um, contrarian. Oh, they're making fun of Biden, but they're also making fun of Trump in like a comic world where it's like, I just wanted to buy a Funko pop. I just wanted to shake right. the hands of Rick from walking dead. And that's like the only reason that they're there. Okay. I do not understand. And I never will understand why people pay so much money for a celebrity photo op. They're so poop. And they stand far apart. And it's like that celebrity probably they don't care at all, at all, at all. You don't talk. You don't do anything. And it may be because I've grown up in Southern California. So I'm like, oh, there's a fucking celebrity. Who cares? You know, but I don't know. I <laughs> they should let you grab, grab them for like the money that you pay. Like you should be able to get a grab them however you want. <laughs> yeah. For, yeah. <laughs> Pay, pay 20 bucks extra because now you've got like a photo that means something more than just a hover hand. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, maybe it was, uh, maybe I was looking at uh COVID era things, but you know, big, big a plexiglass between people. They're sitting in, you know, the person sitting in a chair. It's just so awkward. I don't know why people pay that money. So, I mean, we're kind of in the same space and I always wonder this one from my own self, but like, Let's say Mike Lindell from my pillow drops by and he's like, here's quarter of a million to throw some gas on the fire. What what are you doing? You know, the the first month out with 250 grand with the stipulation, like you have to spend it all on Flip City. Oh, yeah. OK, um, I would number one, hire people to optimize our website including all the tagging, tracking, all that kind of stuff to effectively digitally market. That would be one of our first buys. Uh, I would definitely get myself a workstation, computer and full setup to be comfortable at my desk. Um, uh, gosh, it had to be, well, I, I then actually probably would then sign up for comic conventions just to go and travel. Because that's Flip City, right? I, then I wouldn't care if I'm losing money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so vacation. A working vacation, though, you know? Uh, yeah, that's kind of been mine and my husband's relationship is basically everything, like gifts we give each other and vacations we take, because we've always kind of been in the creative space and we've made a documentary before and all that, is it's all work-related, but it's fine. You know, so we take vacations, but it, they're working vacations because we're working in creative space. So, you know, it's fun. So, or, yeah. I mean, I've kind of done the same thing now where all, almost all of my travels kind of based around, is there a convention? Is there like a shop that I wanted to get my books in, which I don't care about as much now. I mean, I've been a little bit blackpilled from John uh, De La Rose, um, of oh, what comics he say? gate fan uh, fame. Well, he he basically was saying, forget about the brick and mortars, like don't even care about them. The profit margin is too sl slim. The real estate is too little. Uh, the traffic just isn't there that there's some people that can move those kind of numbers. But really, why go through the extra steps to get yourself in the brick and mortar and all like if whether it's cold calling or doing a traditional distribution network through Diamond or Panda or any of those other options? Why do that if you can just do direct to consumer? If you can get people to go to your site and just buy it directly from you, why worry about the brick and mortars? You know, and I'm going to I'm going to maybe flip that around. Well, and specifically for us, the reason I'd like to get into brick and mortars is because we have a subscription model. So even if we're not making great money in the margins are tight on that, the real end goal is to get people to come and subscribe. 
you know, so we have that. Um, number two, not everybody is online. You know, everyone fact, that matters. No. <laughs> no? No. Uh, well, that's the thing. I would not be online, especially on social media. I hate social media so much that I would not be on social media if it was not for our magazine. You know, I enjoy going outdoors. I might be on YouTube, things like that. And and maybe like the independent spaces um, like Telegram or Discord or things like that, like little communities where I can get my conspiracy news and conspiracy fix. And that's about it. But I would not be on social media. It's it's uh, soul crushing to me. I mean, if if anything's happening, though, the world as a whole seems to be trending more towards everything well, being social media. So so some of the being off social media now, I think it's it's extra cool because now there's like a novelty aspect, like going outside and, and camping in the mountains <laughs> or doing like hiking. Right now, it's like a novel experience. Like you feel like you're tapping into like some it and in some ways it's almost going to be like going to one of those colonial towns where it's like oh my god this is so cool look how they churn butter but if you were actually in that time churning butter you're like this isn't so hot you know what i mean this yeah, is actually right? <laughs> kind of crappy this isn't that big of a deal um right it's the same thing like people are like it's actually i'd rather if i could just like take a car to where i was going and not have to hike but that was just the the sign of the times i don't know it's 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 weird that that becomes the the escape, whereas true. like it, it's like inverted <laughs> itself. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it has. But yeah, um, yeah, I just don't. I don't know. Do you like social media? Do you enjoy being on it? I don't. I don't like social anything. Real life, <laughs> digital life. Um, I actually like. I, I you're like. I can't. I can't wait for this interview to be over. I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't, it's, it's weird. I don't want to sound like all emo and stuff. It's not like, I like to be lonely. Um, like I like having friends and I like having uh sounding boards and, you know, having like a little community to identify with and stuff, small group, but also it takes like, even if I'm going to go and spend times with best friends and family members, it takes like little chunks out of my energy meter. You know what I mean? Um, I and I and I almost feel in the 2019 2020 event where it's like people couldn't leave their house and they couldn't go into public areas and it was killing some people like like people were going absolutely nuts, changing their whole personalities, like like rediscovering themselves because it was such this dramatic thing. And the whole time I was just like, I've been training for this my whole <laughs> life. Like if there's one time when I can shine, it's going to be, you know, now I didn't, I didn't do anything special. I just didn't go crazy, I guess was like the big, the big payoff. Right. Right. Well, that's, you know, I worked, I worked through the whole thing because I was working outside of the house at that point in time and it was in the construction in industry. Plus we're, we're in a place. Okay. We got cut off, but you were talking about, uh, you were not working at home during the 2019, 2020, you were doing like construction out of the house and. Um, so yeah, what, at what oh. point did, did everything change for you then? As far as like the COVID thing? Uh, well, I, I mean, I assume that you started working from home at a certain point. Oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, I, I had a job I, I, that I actually rather enjoyed. Um, but yeah, in, uh, late 2021, I hired somebody to take over my position at the company I was working for. Um, and, uh, January 1st of 2022, I left to do flip city full time and, um, yeah. So I've been working full time from home for what two, is that two and a half years now? Yeah. And, uh, work was kind of social before and so now is, it's different. Is Flip City your full-time job now? <laughs> yes, it is my way more than full-time job. And, you know, I, I like to call, call it our paper baby because it takes all of our money, time and attention. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of like a, a huge deal to be able to leave your job working for the man, right. Or working for somebody else and then end up yeah. kind of working for yourself and in effect, working for your customers, uh, in a way, D do you ever wish that you could just like wake up one day and just like clock into an office? Uh, and uh, 
Yeah. On during our slow revenue times and when we're, you know, kind of panicking, you know, if we're going to make our bills because independent publishing, man, it is a real freaking beast. So yeah, once in a while, I wish that I had a regular paycheck coming in because it is scary, you know, but that's all, that's part of, you know, entrepreneurship and staying on your grind. Uh, so how long have you been doing Flip City? Uh, we published our first edition in March of 2020. And what was the inspiration to do it in 2020 in particular? Was it related to the pandemic at all? No, it, it actually wasn't, even though our first uh, cover is the, um, you know, virus with the mask. You can find that on our website. So if you which is the safest City. kind of virus, by the way. Is it the one with the mask? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, um, yeah, it's a, it, it's in front of the mask. So, um, yeah, it obviously bounced right off cause it didn't go through the mask. Well, as long but, as there's a mask in the picture, that's all that really matters. Cause it's more about the thought that counts. Right. Yeah. Well, so the concept we came up with, uh, uh in the fall of 2019 and Scott got to work on it. Our first three editions were all written and illustrated the entire thing um, by him. And then we started picking up artists with issue four. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the, the reason we started publishing in print is because um, there, there were things to be said. Like I said, at the beginning of our interview, there was a torch that was dropped by mad and cracked and everything that it was time for a subversive satire, you know, blasted out to the free world in print or, you know, as far as we know, free world in print. And, um, uh, we didn't even know when we first launched, if it was going to be a print magazine, but we had somebody, um, talk about us. that had a very supportive audience that, kind of flooded us and um we offered digital or print editions and print sold like 98 percent of the time to two percent digital so we decided to make it a print magazine and we haven't looked back so you know. no digital option at all uh no there uh there's a digital subscription option we don't sell them digitally individually um but we're always you know we're always pivoting and deciding, you know, what new product to release. I think we probably will release digitally, but maybe through like a third party website, like a comics, you know, um, a comics uh, provider or something like that. If they'll Just have to, you. <laughs> if, they, if they'll have us. I've seen, um, I've seen one that a lot of the indies are using right now. And it seems like kind of a smaller platform, but the guy seems somewhat based. So I can't remember the name of it right now, but the global. Well, yes. Global comics. Global Do you know comics. much about that? Um, I, what I know is that someone was hyping it up to me the other day and I was like, Oh, I should go in and check this out and put up some comics. And when I did that, I logged in and I saw that I had a, a comic that I had uploaded to them in like 20, like, like, 2014 or something that had like been there forever oh really um, but I, I guess apparently uh a large publication like some big comic released on them recently and they had a whole bunch of influx of people so it it kind of got like a second wind in a way i'm all for oh, it uh, okay i haven't seen any direct revenue off of it in those like 10 plus years that i guess it was on and i and i re-uploaded some newer stuff too uh, but for whatever weird reason, I always find when I go into these bustling social media uh, economies, like I kind of am, I'm homeless there, too, where it's like, I don't know if I just immediately am put into the like the short bus or into like the weird closet yeah. and they lock me away or something. But uh, I don't I tend to not see a lot of the residual uh, traffic that everyone's like, you know, bustling about. Yes. And that is something that I think um, maybe we might be struggling with as well. I, I'm i just trying to make friends in the indie scene that will have us because th those are going to be the coolest people, in my opinion, or the people that will have us and support what we're doing. But um, yeah, the indie comic scene is, uh, you know, I like everything else, you know, anywhere you step, you're going to step in a pile of shit, you know, in 
and I'm not saying indie comics is shit, but basically, you know, drama, all that kind of stuff. Cause I did watch part of your interview with um, John Della Rose and he was kind of schooling you on what comics um, gate was. And I had no and, idea. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> no, I was laughing because <laughs> I, I had, I've been staying out of it because we're not real comics, comics people. I feel like the redheaded stepchild of like the indie comic space. And I, I have a feeling we're not going to really ever be op- welcome with open arms. And we just got to find our people like everything else, you know, you know, cause we're a subversive and edgy. So edgy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still looking for my Pete though. The closest that I've got are just the paranoid American readership. That's like the closest to the tribe. But every time I find some little conspiracy click, or an indie comic, uh, you know, coven or whatever the hell they call. It. I don't know what they call themselves when you get a bunch of indie comics together. Uh, but all those groups, <laughs> indie comics I, coven. Yeah, I, like I, I don't it. know, or like a gaggle or something. <laughs> but I always, I always feel like something will come up, and I'm like, oh wow, I believe the exact opposite of what these guys are talking about. And it doesn't matter what group I'm in, I always have well, those weird thoughts, and yeah, it makes you me seem just like- not want to be in them anymore. Well, you seem like a contrarian. Absolutely. <laughs> I disagree. I disagree wholeheartedly. I think it's why I like you. I'm like, dude, this guy does not give a shit. <laughs> for for my own detriment, usually. Uh, and it's the same thing with, yeah, like with the AI stuff. I'm I'm actually kind of like bored of the AI. And I do feel that it's all just becoming like the same thing over and over. It's like Taco Bell uh, of like art and music where some people convince themselves like, oh, I like the, the Taco Bell burrito and someone else like, oh, I like the Taco Bell taco. And it's like, you idiots. It's the ex- it's like literally the exact same thing with a different like packaging on the mm-hmm. outside. And once yes. you get through the outside, it's all like the identical ingredients and everything. Uh, it, I don't know. It just kind of feels so much like that to me. But when people hated so much, if someone went out there and they were like, we need to we need to end Taco Bell. We need to pro de- we need to put Taco Bell out of service like. I'm getting a Baja blast every day just because <laughs> of that like contrarian mentality. You know what I mean? Wait, so you are you telling me that like conspiracy groups won't have you? Oh yeah, 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 like big time. Be- because the con so like I grew up <laughs> and I started Paranoid American in an absolute bubble. Like I didn't know anybody in my immediate vicinity, friend group, family, business, no one that was like wants to sit down and talk about the McMartin preschool trial for two hours. You know what I mean? Like it takes a very special person to even care about that, let alone want to talk about it. And the Franklin scandal and Larry King and like all these weird niche topics. And at a certain point I just gave up and I was like, I'll talk to myself through comics and put that out there. And maybe that conversation will start somewhere. Uh, But like, that was kind of like my whole start in comics and talking about conspiracy theories was kind of like a cry for help of like, please, somebody let me let me discuss this in the way that I'm thinking about it, which happened to be like silly dick jokes and, you know, like mind control operations, but like all that in the same context. Um, and I don't know, like I I feel that when I get into the conspiracy community, which is like a weird word to say it, they have the exact same like single issue thing. So like, for example, I believe in dinosaurs that puts me on some people's uh, shit list. It, it wouldn't get them like to uninvite me the flat earth thing though. If I'm not like ultra receptor, if I don't buy in or if I, if I've seen all of the flat earth documentaries, which I have because I've had to interview uh, pretty much all of the main like flat earth people. And I'm just, I just not in the camp still like the, the programming through the Rockefeller education system is just like too deeply ingrained in my head, but that almost, is seen as like I'm a stooge, right? Like I'm a plant for working for the globalists or the or the the globe tards or whatever the name is for them, and that in itself brings on a little bit of animosity because it's like how dare you be in the conspiracy realm, but like touting the you know the line, the company line somehow on all these different aspects. So yeah, I don't I'm, I don't feel welcome in almost any of these groups out here. Right. Okay. Well. Yeah, that's that's funny. Another one, big one is like Tom Hanks, right? Like I still I'm on the fence. I don't know if Tom Hanks is murdering people and, and like is a cannibal and stuff off screen, but even this, though he posts the creepy pictures of like gloves and shoes and stuff. 
are really, because that's the thing too. I mean, I don't spend a ton of time in conspiracy circles or anything like that, but are they, are they really rejecting or do you just feel like maybe they're like, well, eh, here's paranoid American. He's not paranoid enough. A, it's for a, us. a little bit of A and B, but no, I mean, I've, I've explicitly been called out by name and, and like on live streams more, more than just once or twice or three times of kind of being like a Freemason shill uh, that is like working against the community and how dare I, uh, which is, it's a weird situation to be in because again, at the end of the day, like I'm only putting these comics out because that was the only way I could communicate my true feelings about some of this stuff in a way that wouldn't require me to like in real time defend why I've got a dick joke next to a Project Monarch uh, breakdown. Right. And see, and that's the thing, too, that it seems like you're like this, that even if you're you're like reasonably unreasonable, you know, like where if somebody's not agreeing with you, you're not going to say, oh, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Or I think you're this or that is. It, do you hold that? You know, yeah, you can no, still I'll, be friends with people that are like, hey, I think so. It's usually not reciprocated the same way. My, I guess my <laughs> favorite thing that I'm realizing very late in life now, like I'm in my forties and I'm just realizing that one of my favorite things to do is to pick apart and point out hypocrisy because I, I think it's like an endlessly fascinating time. It's like a self humbling thing. Like the second that you realize you're being hypocritical, you have to be humbled by it. And I really think that those conversations are some of the most interesting ones when, when like you can point out the inconsistencies of somebody's like philosophy. Oh, I believe X, Y, and Z. And that's why I do this. And you're like, well, what about this part? You know, is that not like, I love those questions, but not everyone is always like super happy to entertain uh, having their like entire world picked apart, you know, piece by piece the same way that, you know, I'm like maybe black pilling you on AI is actually is going to kill us all and destroy us. And that humans are just <laughs> big bags of mush that, you know, yes. can be easily swindled constantly. Some people take, I don't know, take, if, you, I don't know take if you, offense to that. I don't know if you black pilled me because, you know, I'm going to just go back, you know, after I think on it for maybe 10 minutes and say, OK, that's going to get stored back here. What Thomas said that time. And uh, yeah, we'll take him in, in small doses, because if I yeah, you'll just wake Thomas up one much, night I, and like I will like be black. Fever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that that is funny because um, that kind of goes is kind of close to how I deal with um trying to combat cognitive dissonance right because i've experienced it with other people that i think are like super open-minded and everything and i bring the, them this piece of evidence that i believe you know proves something is true like something pretty big and uh, and they watch it and then they never talk to me again they just won't engage with this one topic and i'm like I think they're suffering from cognitive dissonance. Um, and then I'm like, well, I know I'm probably suffering from cognitive dissonance, but um, the way I think the way I am personally com trying to combat it in myself is um, always remembering I'm not above being propagandized. You know, my brain just does isn't that functional where I can't be propagandized and that's how I deal with it. But I think it's similar to what you're saying, you know, is uh, hypocrisy. Now, do you find your own hypocrisy in your thought lines or oh, yeah. I mean, training but yourself? I, but I, I kind of feel like I like to embrace the hypocrisy uh, and like almost like a, I don't know what, if it's not Taekwondo, but whatever, is it jujitsu, whatever the one is where like you redirect someone else's energy and turn it into like, their offense becomes your offense. I'm I'm describing this the horrible way. Like they throw a punch, you kind of like push them along, like use their momentum, and they just like flip them over you or something. Right. Uh, I I kind of see that. Like you're never going to, in my mind, no one's gonna fully integrate their shadow completely, and they never have any more hypocritical um, thoughts, and they're never inconsistent. Like it'll always happen. It's kind of like the curse that we're in. So I kind of like pointing it out and almost like emphasizing it and making a joke out of it and not taking it as seriously. Um, I mean, I don't have any practical examples because I'm very consistent. I very um, almost never uh, have any, like I, I'm, I'm not a hypocrite at all, really. 
like and you're very humble. I am very humble. Yeah, <laughs> but I know I, I I like to like highlight it. I like to put it on blast a little bit, and it's not in like a like a public square kind of way, but it's more of like see everybody poops. You know what I mean? It's that's kind of the the feeling of it, like the same concept of the book where it's like it's this thing that everyone feels is this mark of shame. But it's like everyone's pooping out here. Like there's not a single right. person on the planet that's not doing it, even if you never yes. talk about it and you pretend like you don't. Uh, I I kind of feel like that way. And there is a line, right? Like that's why fart and potty humor can be funny to all ages because there's like something inside of you that's like, oh, this is you know this is kind of dirty. This is kind of funny. But if if that's your thing, if you're just talking about poop all the time. Like that's the other end of the extreme. So there's definitely like a, a balance in between those two uh, talking about hip hypocrisy in particular. I think my, my favorite kind of people, which I realized this recently are self-aware hypocrites. Um, like the ones that realize it as they're doing it and are maybe not apologetic about it, or maybe even are just the, the fact that you are acknowledging your own hypocrisy is like my favorite thing. And I usually get along with those people famously. And the second that, someone says that they are not a hypocrite or they like <laughs> like I've I've had those points I've had interviews and I had to stop asking the question because sometimes I don't want to know but I'll be like are you a hypocrite like I just like that <laughs> question in particular because there is a very binary like some people are like no of course not you know what I mean it's like right. why would you say that um but that's never the right answer like the only answer is is like a resounding yes uh like an emphatic well, yes and if you say yes to that and I guess I've stacked the deck. Are you a hypocrite? Oh, me? Well, gosh, I guess I am. Yeah, but you kind of have thing. to be after that. Well, yeah, I mean, I and that's the thing. You're a contrarian. I try to go along to get along. So I'm totally not a hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying it to please you. No, I no. As you're talking, I'm trying to think of like example examples of my own hypocrisy. And I can't think of anything, but I'm sure they're there. You know, and and I'm sure the longer we get to know each other and everything, you'll point it out to me and I'll be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> see, but I, see, that's the thing, though, is that I I've learned way before my 40s. Like I learned as a as a child to not point out hypocrisy. Most people it's like you have to be already with a lot of rapport and in a safe, comfortable space where two people are like good with being a little bit vulnerable to each other in order to start pointing that stuff out. I used to point out hypocrisy in the middle of like class, like to the teacher, you know what I mean? Like, and then you learn that there's certain plate, like in the military, like maybe don't point out that your, you know, your drill instructor is being inconsistent in his application of the rules and training. Like things. I can't believe a person like you was in the military. That is uh, insane. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, but it's, see, it's the <laughs> ultimate contrarian move, right? Because right. everyone expected me to be so anti- so it was just like, I'll show you how anti I am. You don't know. <laughs> You're like, you can't put me in a box. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, part, that's another part of it, too, is that like I'm a conspiracy theorist and I do think that the United States government wants us all dead uh, with, you know, prejudice. But I also think America is the greatest country that's ever existed. Uh, and I'm like very pro patriotic in a weird way that's like I again I embrace my programming the same way that I love Disney and Mickey Mouse even though it is a like a hundred percent mind control they've planted memories into our heads to make us buy things and fall into certain politics but I love that about our country and I love that someone's like you like they're applying like the thing comes up a lot too is like Edward Bernays and Sigmund Freud and like all this like propaganda and how propaganda is being worked into everything and how McDonald's has red fry boxes because they know that red makes you feel hot like all these weird subliminal things like I like that I like that they care so much about pleasing us and and wanting us to go along but also because these formulas are kind of open source now and it's just interesting being able to like poke and prod it. Okay, let's take this thing and make it this color. Like I, me and you don't have the scale and the resources to say like, what would happen if Flip City had an all red cover and we included like, you know, a free coupon for a burger. I don't know, like you don't have the resources and I don't to test right. those things out, but some people do. 
And I think that that's a net positive. I really do think it's more of a net positive um, that the companies are trying to program us because it res it results in like a, a higher level of culture. And, and that's again, it's like a thing that conspiracy theorists might not buy into or understand. But I really do feel that way. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting viewpoint that I've taken no time to think about. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, it would be nice. It would be nice to have those resources to know how to uh, correctly manipulate, you know, because that's something that I've been trying to train myself. I'm like, how do how do I change my own communication methods to actually match that of a, somebody that studied marketing and and manipulation? It, that is what marketing is, is basically manipulating. And I just feel like. I, I have too much respect for people to try to manipulate them, but also, you know, I, that's just marketing, you know, it's like buy my stuff and we're terrible at selling the magazine. That's why we don't have millions of dollars. Cause if we were good at selling the magazine, it would sell. <laughs> yeah. You know? A little bit of the same here. I've got a good friend that is, uh, does marketing professionally for like big companies and stuff. And God bless him that he's always giving me advice that I'm doing my best to integrate. But the, the last time we talked, he he had this really good point because I had a Kickstarter that I ran and it did really well, but it could have done a lot better. Um, like everything can always do a little bit better. And I'm always wondering, like, what would have got me like 2x or 5x or 10x? And he was showing me some other really successful Kickstarter comic campaigns. And one of the things they pointed out is that in um in a 15 day period, this one campaign that he was showing me, the owners had sent out 17 emails in 15 days. And in my mind, I'm just like, that's insane. Like, like that would break me. And I'd be like, unsubscribe. I hate you guys. Stop spamming me. Um, but he was making a great point that like the numbers don't lie like that like they got the results like regardless of how spammy and scammy it might seem to like be blasting 17 emails in 15 days about this one project and some ancillary ones the this whole point of like for some for a lot of people they have to see something seven times until it even registers in their mind and for flip city for example if you don't have ad buys then how else are they going to see Flip City seven times unless you are the one that's spamming the hell out of their email and their social media constantly? Yep. And it makes sense. Like, you, like if no one else is doing it, you have to be the one that do that has to do that. And like in a very real way, it was like him telling me you have to send an email every day, essentially. And that was like an extreme version. Like I'm ramping myself into that. Yeah. Um, like I'll do like two a month and they, they, then I'll do like three or four a month, but like 17 is still really hard. Yeah. And it was almost like he was like, Oh, you want to sell comics? You just got to go and like punch your grandma on the face every once in a while. It almost had that same feel of like when he was like, Oh, you got to send out 17 emails in, in a month. It was just like, what? Like I wouldn't do that. How, who, <laughs> what kind of a person do you think I am? You know what I mean? Like he was yes. asking me to violate some weird moral code. <laughs> yes. But yes. I've heard that the, exact everything you said. I learned this last year when I was going to launch our Black Friday sale way too late. I was planning it way, way too late. And I'm like, OK, I'm going to do this next year. But it was exactly that. The Somebody has to see it seven times to make it register. And then also, you don't. Not everybody's opening every single email, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, it does kind of make sense. And same exact feeling like oh, you, me, a spammer. Never. <laughs> but mm, well, and, and there was a, a good point that he was making <clears throat> that I kind of came to my like we we kind of I think he was leading me to it like a Socratic method way. But it was just like the the person that unsubscribes because they, you know, God forbid they saw five emails from you in one month. Um, they were probably not the person that was gonna get affected by that email campaign anyways, but that one person leaving that probably wasn't going to grab anything new anyways, like even if it's a hundred, even if a hundred people unsubscribe, chances are none of them were going to grab something. And if it just gets like the one person nudges them over like, oh yeah, I forgot this existed. Let me grab that. It would be crazy not to cater to the one, even at the sake of the hundred. 
uh, because they're in two different classes. You know, it's it's a it's a weird mentality to put out there. But the biggest one was like, yeah, you're competing against companies and products that have multiple sources of ad buys. Like you might see it on billboards and benches and like, you know, the Ritos is like promoting another cross brand, like all all this stuff is going on. So if it's not me or you just constantly spamming social media or email, then it's getting lost in the noise. There's really no other way to go about it. Yep. Yep. And I think we both can get better at it. Let's do it. Yeah, let's let's spam more. <laughs> yeah. No, I see you're pretty good on on over on X when you have a campaign running of putting stuff out a lot. That, that is 100 uh, percent to his credit. And it was basic. The advice that I got there was when you've got an active campaign, post at least uh, two things a day about that campaign and to always use like a different picture. Like, don't just have the one post and keep reposting it. And all like every single one of the tips was like so common sense obvious, but I never considered almost any of it. Um, and it's, it does kind of help if, if it's, even if it doesn't lead to more sales in general, it just gets me calloused about not caring about all of the trash and the filth that I'm putting out into the world and saying, bye-bye. And here's a coupon code and all that. Right. Right. Totally understandable. And yeah, I need to get better at both things, the email and the, and the, uh, social media marketing. And, uh, yeah, I bet your audience didn't know we were going to give them marketing tips. Tonight. I didn't know either. Yeah. And uh, yeah. even tips, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just talking about like, I'm, I've missed the boat by so long. Like I'm just barely catching up with all the things that I was supposed to be doing. Cause, uh, I didn't do a subscription model. I started this in 2012 and it very much was like that, like a cry for help slash therapy thing where I think for 10 years I was just making content and I might post a picture on uh, Facebook every once in a while uh, and I would put them up for sale. But there was zero marketing, no campaigns, no nothing. Like I ran my first campaign a couple of years ago and wow. it was it was huge, though. It Like it actually. I was kind of kicking myself for not doing it earlier. But when I first started, there was this this really weird ladder anxiety to quote like a gaming concept. I don't know if you know what that is, but I don't. Uh, ladder, ladder anxiety is like when you play competitive gaming and you get up to like a certain level and you're like, I want to hold on to this ranking. If I if I play another game and I go up against someone that's way better then they're going to knock me down in rank. So it's like I'd rather just kind of stay at this like somewhat high rank and not risk it and go, but what well, I kind of, I had this weird, similar feeling with like putting a comic out. I wanted to do a Kickstarter because that would actually bring money in to raise for the next comic and do for the print run. But also I didn't want to have that mark on my permanent record of like, Oh, you try to raise, you know, two, three grand for a book and you didn't make it. You only raised 400 or something like that. And I would I would have rather have just gone broke and took out some loans and made the book happen without worrying about that extra amount of like stress and trying to match and do all the promotion and marketing and stuff. Uh, just because that whole feeling of like it felt like someone was asking me to like punch somebody that I loved when they were like, go out and promote your things, which is a strange, unhealthy way to think about things, especially as a yes. business owner <laughs> slash entrepreneur. Right. <laughs> Yeah, but I think that's that's pretty typical of creatives. I've seen that all over the place, especially with um, a lot. It's crazy how many of our contributors have their own thing going on. And I actively seek things out that are going on. I, I like to pretend like that's how I do have fun on social media or on, on the internet is I feel like it's like the um, 80s and 90s. I am looking for that underground thing, the people that aren't, um, aren't promoting and stuff like that. And then show people like, wow, look at this cool thing. And pretty much all of our contributors, not all of them, but plenty of them have their own projects that they've crowdfunded a couple hundred dollars over here for their little comic book, or so this guy has a card game or things like that, but they're not saying shit anywhere except for like in their own telegram channel that has 30 people. And I'm like, dude, you got to do a little better. <laughs> you know? And so I'll grab it and at least tweet about it. Not that I have any kind of real social media reach or anything, but I know it feels good when people talk about your work. So yeah, we're that's all why I do it. I think that's what it is. 
right, I've I've got a little segment before we go, and I'll I'll splice it in right now. Okay, we're back from the segment, and wow, that's cool. a great segment. It's it's you're gonna love it when you see it in post. Okay. Uh, but the the rules are I'm just gonna I'm gonna mention a phrase or a concept to you, and you're gonna rate it one to ten or zero to ten, whatever you want to do. Uh, they'll basically equate your number with how much you believe in it. So I'll, we'll start with an easy example. If I say Bigfoot, how much do you think Bigfoot exists or has ever existed on a scale from one to ten? But can I make up my own scale? You have to follow one to ten. So okay, one to ten. So if, right. if you're on the fence or if you don't care, it could be a five. If you're all in right. on Bigfoot, it's you know ten. Bigfoot, Bigfoot is an eight for me. How about little gray uh, alien men, or they them's? Sorry, I didn't mean to misgender the reticulans. Um, seven. How about flat Earth? Five dinosaurs the way that we've been taught them in schools five fire breathing flying dragons at any time in history that they actually like existed. actual actual like the ones like you see in game of thrones like i don't care what size they are but like a reptilian that can fly and breathe fire four astral projection Nine. Ghosts. Eight. Demons. Nine. Angels. Ten. Nephilim. I think that's a ten, too. Okay, here, here's a slightly longer uh, setup for one, but since you said demons were a nine, angels were a ten, let's say a complete atheist slash agnostic goes on Amazon and purchases the top three, how to summon a demon for dummies guidebooks. Um, the, the meaning here being that like, they don't have some ancient grimoire that's got magic bestowed on it. And they don't have like some blood dripped manuscript. They just go to Amazon. They order the top three bestsellers on how to summon demons. They get printed on demand digitally sent to their house, never touched by human hands, essentially. One to ten that that person can summon a demon that weekend based on those three Amazon books. Five. I want to talk about that one a little bit more. <laughs> five, five being like on the fence for what reason? Like what would get what would get you to a four or get you to a six in this case? Um, maybe uh, maybe any other background that they have in um. Uh, 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 what's the word when you like do magic and shit? Well, well, the 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 point here being though that if they're agnostic or atheist, part of the big aspect of magic is that there has to be like intent. So, what if the intent is just to see if magic works, and not necessarily with like evil in their heart or even with pure intentions in their heart, like not black or white magic, just okay. like. I want to well, see if this actually if, if does If I can su summon a demon. Yeah, and, and if you do and you're like, oh, crap, my bad, I guess they're real, and now I'm going to hell, but I, I found out. Right. Well, that would be real terrible for that person, wouldn't it? If they were able to summon a demon and it happened. I'd say, like, you don't play with that stuff. <laughs> I wouldn't play with that stuff. Anyway, so what would get me to a six? on whether they well, you, could. you said don't play with that stuff so it almost sounds like you're already out of six yeah i think so i guess maybe i am a little what, more at a six what so, already. So let's see you you walk into your theoretical kid's bedroom he's been, you know they've, they've been quiet in there for a while and you're like oh, they're up yeah. to something you go in there and they're you know summoning demons and they're like cutting blood and they're doing like pentagrams and stuff i'd be a little frightened Right. Be, at, yeah. At what though? Like what? What specifically they, are you frightened of? Um. I am frightened of them going down a dark path, even if it is self-induced and nothing. There is nothing uh, supernatural about it. Um. You know, I think. You know, trying to summon demons and drawing pentagrams and all that kind of stuff. 
probably leads to depression and things like that. <laughs> Fair point. What if what if you walk into the room and little Jimmy's like uh, doing Pentecostal like snake handling? Same same reaction, or do they get a little bit more credit since it's kind of got like a Jesus twang to it? No, I don't. I think I'd have the same reaction <laughs> if they're handling snakes. Yeah. That's is quite there, dangerous. Is there any extremist <laughs> position that someone could take that you'd be like, good on you? Like, I support this extremist position. Um, <laughs> not that I'm going to say on on a uh, Okay, stream. fair enough. Fair <laughs> point. <laughs> but yeah, down I, think, rifles I, think and... there, I think there are a couple of positions that get me in trouble where I'm like, I, I think you might be right about that. <laughs> All right, well... We'll we'll bring this one to a close just because we're gonna get kicked out of uh, Zoom anyways uh, in the next couple minutes. So give another plug to where people can find and subscribe to Flip City Magazine. Well, please, I think at the very least, just go to flipcitymag.com and read our free magazine. Um, you can download it. We do take your email, so I can uh, email market to you once every month. <laughs> And then Gross. Hope, and then and then like maybe during Christmas, I'll send you like. 12 emails and and check it out if you want to buy it just like um, jesus intended oh but what is great is we're putting out a brand new sampler very soon so maybe even by the time that this is posted on your channel we will have a sampler um digital edition that you can download for free make you love us and come back and subscribe at flipcitymag.com and you can find all our social media links and everything else there as well that was perfect and we've got 30 seconds to spare. So I'll use this bye. as a quick little plug. We'll say bye <laughs> and go in, uh, go to nasacomic.com, go to paranoidamerican.com uh, and go and look up Sound Scientists on Spotify and uh, iTunes and all of the places to listen to some truly remarkable AI, non-hypocritical music. They're fun. It's fun music. I love it. Ready for a cosmic conspiracy about Stanley Kubrick, moon landings, and the CIA? Go visit nasacomic.com. Nasacomic.com, CIA's biggest con. Stanley Kubrick put us on this while we're singing this song. I'm nasacomic.com. Go visit nasacomic.com. Go visit nasacomic.com. CIA's biggest con Stanley Kubrick put us on this While we're singing this song About NASACOMIC.com Go visit NASACOMIC.com Go visit NASACOMIC.com Yeah, go visit NASACOMIC.com Never a straight answer is a 40-page comic about Stanley Kubrick oh. directing the Apollo space missions. This is the perfect read for comic, Kubrick, or conspiracy fans of all ages. For more details, visit nasacomic.com. My life away, driven the right to pay. Will it enlight your brain? Give you the flight, my plane, paper the highs ablaze. Somewhat of an amazing feel when it's real, the real you will engage it. Your favorite, of course, the Lord of an arrangement. I gave you the proper results to hit the pavement. If they get emotional, hey, maybe your language, a game, how they playing it well without Lakers. Evade them, whatever the cost, they are the shape shift. Snakes get decapitated, met is the apex. Execution of flame, you out, look. Nuclear bomb, distributed at war, rather gruesome for eyes to see. Max them out, then I light my trees, blow it off in the face.
face, you're despising me for what though? Calculated and rather cutthroat. Paranoid American must be all the blood smoke for real. Lord, give me a day away, vacate. They wait around to hate whatever they say. Man, it's not in the least bit weak. It heavy rotate when a beat hits. So thank us, you're welcome. Fuck the niggas for real, you're welcome. They ain't never had a deal, you're welcome. Man, they lacking appeal, you're welcome. Yet they doing it still, you're welcome.